Hello, thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to talk about medicinal plants of Acadiana and how to use them. We'll also do a little bit of talking about the healer's garden and how it came to be. The information presented today is meant for educational and historical use only. It is not meant as a substitute for medical diagnosis or treatment. Plants are considered to work as preventative medicine. Many work well in non-emergency situations, but they may also work well in emergency situations until medical help can be obtained. They also may work as adjunct therapeutic agents since herbal and allopathic therapies can complement and enhance each other. But on the other hand, they can also work adversely to each other, so make certain you understand what you're doing before mixing them. And always tell your doctor everything that you're taking. Even if he laughs, you've done your part by telling him. The history of the garden. In 1933, a gentleman named Charles Bienvenu was doing his master's thesis to the French department of LSU. His topic was the Negro-French dialect of St. Martin Parish. And he could have asked these people to talk about absolutely anything because he didn't care what they were saying. He only cared about their grammar, their vocabulary, their pronunciation, etc. But by some wonderful piece of serendipity, he asked them to tell him about their home remedies. So we have 570 first-person accounts of the medicinal use of plants in the Creole language in the Acadiana area. Without Bienvenu's thesis, we would not know what these plants were used for, we wouldn't know how to prepare them, and in most cases, we wouldn't even know the French names for them. But the thesis alone does not make a garden. Dr. C. Ray Brasher, who's president of the Vermilionville Board, and head of the anthropology department at ULL, presented his idea to the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners. They partnered with the Vermilionville Living History Museum to develop Le Jardin du Traiteur. The committee members carried out serious research to document the use of the plants that are in the garden, but the thesis was only the starting point. All the plants in the garden are either native to Louisiana or they were imported to the area very early and were documented as having been in common use medicinally prior to 1900. The Healer's Garden is a joint project of the Lafayette Masters Gardeners and Vermilionville. So how can you use plants? You can use plants fresh, you can use them dried, you can obtain them a lot of different ways. So let's start with you can grow your own. Things like basil, spearmint, peppermint, lemon balm, rosemary, they're common. You can get them at any nursery. Or you can use your own weeds. Things like dock, mullen, spiny pigweed, tea grass, British mallow, all medicinal. You can wild craft. That means collecting growing plants. But to do this, you have to ensure that you know how to identify the plants. You can use field guides. They help. But the best way is to tour with an expert until you're satisfied that you really know how to identify that plant. If you're going to collect on private land, obtain permission first. If you're going to collect on public land, make certain that it's legal. There are places where it's illegal to collect even a single leaf. Ensure that the plants have not been sprayed with pesticides. You definitely don't want to add them to your medicines. Collect away from roadways to ensure that plants are not coated with exhaust fumes, tire particles, and other emissions. Ethical wildcrafting means you never, ever take an endangered plant. You can go to www.united-plantsavers.org, and they will tell you which ones are at risk, over-harvested, suffering habitat loss, endangered, whatever. Don't mess with those plants. Collect only where the plant is abundant and never take more than 10% of a given stand. Know the plant's reproductive methods, and it helps you to know when to harvest. If a plant reproduces by runners or underground rhizomes, you can thin the stand at any time. If it reproduces by seed, you have to wait until after flowering when the seed has developed fully and has ripened. In general, general terms, that means when the seed is fully brown. And you have to leave many, many flowers to reseed. Don't take them all. If you need the bark or roots for your medicines, those are the dangerous ones because they can kill the plant. If you're going to collect bark, never collect all the way around the tree. Collect small sections isolated from one another. If you collect all the way around the tree, that's called girdling, and it will kill the tree or plant. 
if you're going to collect roots or rhizomes, pull them up and leave the crown of the root or the base of the rhizome, replant that, take the side pieces and fill in all your holes. If you're working on a hill, not very common here, but harvest from lower down on the hill, leaving plants at the top, it makes it easier for them to replenish the slope. Collect mindfully. Really think about what you're doing while you're doing it because you don't want to mix plants up. Collect one plant at a time. Label them immediately. And if you're going to do more than one, keep them carefully separate and pre-labeled because once they're, they've wilted, it's really hard to tell one from another. Some definitions. Medicaments. Those are the contents of the plant that have medicinal use or value. It's that which we want to get out of the plant, usually into a liquid. Menstruum is the liquid that the medicaments are extracted into. And extracting medicaments into the menstruum creates an infusion. Now, for an infusion, the liquid can be either water, which makes a tea or a decoction, or it can be ethanol, vinegar, vegetable glycerin, rubbing alcohol, or oil, each of which produces a different product. And you can look at them for yourself here. So extraction of contents into a liquid is an infusion, and most uses are based on infusions. Tea is an infusion into water. Just remember, all teas are infusions, not all infusions are teas. The leaves, flowers, soft stems, the softer parts of a plant are used to make a tea. You make them fresh daily or you can refrigerate them two to three days, but they really don't last very long. If you have a recipe for dried material and you have fresh instead, you can either dry it first or you can just use twice as much fresh plant material as the recipe calls for. So if it's, it's twice as much fresh to dried, if you have a recipe for fresh and all you have is dried, use half as much as it calls for. The greater the surface area, the greater the potency, so either crush or chop very fine. Pour boiled water over the material and allow it to steep, just like if you were making Lipton. A standard infusion is about a half an ounce of dried herb per quart of water. Allow it to steep 30 to 60 minutes or even longer if you want. And that's going to represent about a half a gram of herb for every ounce of tea. Or you can make a strong infusion. This is going to be about four times as strong. A half an ounce of herb, 16 ounces of water, steep for eight hours. And reduce the dose accordingly. One and a half ounces makes a dose versus six ounces in, in a normal tea. It's ideal for bad tasting plants like Monglier. You can just shoot it and be done. Cold infusion is a method used for very delicate plant parts or plants that contain compounds that are heat labile. That means they break down when heated. Or that are highly volatile. That means they'll go up into the air when exposed to heat. You mix one half ounce of herb in a quart of cool water and steep eight to 12 hours. Strain it and drink. Refrigerate one to three days. A decoction is used for tough plant parts. The roots, bark, hard seeds, things like that. You place the plant material and the water into a pan, bring it to a boil, reduce the heat, cover, and simmer 20 to 60 minutes. Absolutely not good for aromatic plants. You can make it standard, one ounce per quart, simmer 10 to 20 minutes, then turn off and steep for an hour. Strong, one ounce per quart, simmer until reduced by half. So you're going to wind up with a pint. And this process will evaporate all the volatiles. They'll be gone. But it extracts the mineral salts, which makes for strong medicine. You can also make syrups. These are yummy. It's easy to get kids to take these. 50% each sweetener and water and 20% by weight, finely divided plant material. In other words, you take 3.2 ounces of dried plant material and a pint of water. Bring to a boil, cover, simmer, reduce to one cup. You'll, be, you'll have eight ounces when you finish. To that, you then add eight ounces of sweetener. If you're using honey, try not to heat it at all, but if you have to heat it, heat it very gently because you want to keep the temp below 110. You want the enzymes in the honey, and heat will kill them. The result will be approximately 0.2 grams per ounce or 0.04 grams per 5 milliliters, which is a teaspoon, a normal dose. You can also add fruit concentrates, essential oils, a tincture, or an ounce of liquor, which will help to stabilize it and make it last longer. You then strain and bottle it, label it, and it'll keep for months and months, especially if refrigerated or if you've added the alcohol. 
It's great for soothing coughs, sore throats, and most digestive upsets. The herbs su suggested for cough syrups are elderberry, wild cherry bark, echinacea purpurea root, mullein leaf, licorice root, and ginger root. The essential oils or tinctures to add are thyme, oregano, and rosemary. Additions that can make the preparation stronger or better absorbed or more effective are cinnamon, rose hips, and black pepper. Tinctures, the most potent preparation, and in many ways the simplest. All you do is take the plant material, add it to the liquid, put it in a jar, and leave it there for six to eight weeks. Okay, let's get more specific. You want herb to liquid ratio of one to five. So if you have one ounce of herb, you want five ounces of liquid. But you always need enough liquid to cover the herb. Pack that into a clean, dry jar, and it is best to pack it. You don't want it too loose in the jar. Pour in the liquid. Alcohol, you want to use more than 80 proof, usually a brandy or vodka. Everclear, pure grain alcohol will work well. You can dilute it to whatever you want. The reason being, 80 proof alcohol is actually 40% alcohol, 60% water. 100 proof alcohol is 50-50. So you want to make sure you have enough alcohol in the final prep. Cover the plant material by an inch or so. Make sure you keep it under the liquid. Label it. Seal tightly. Place in a warm, cool, dark, sunlit, moonlit location, depending on what your recipe tells you. Allow it to steep four to six weeks or six to eight weeks. Shake it every day or two. And please be careful of finishes. Alcohol can do nasty things, especially to antiques. I know from experience, so... Listen, take my advice, don't do what I do. When that's finished, you strain, bottle, and label it. It'll keep indefinitely when stored in a cool, dark place. You can dose it by the dropper full. 30 drops, about one and a half mils, is a very large dose. Now, you can also make acid tinctures, which is made using live apple cider vinegar, one with the mother in it, something like uh, Bragg's or Trader Joe's. Glycerites are made using vegetable glycerin. You follow exactly the same instructions as for the regular tincture, except you use apple cider vinegar or vegetable glycerin instead. A liniment, again, used just like a tincture, but you use either rubbing alcohol or witch hazel as your liquid. These are for external use only. Label with a skull and crossbones. They are not for taking orally. You can make an infused oil or an oil extraction. Mix your dried herbs in oil one to five. Heat gently for 25 to 45 minutes. Cool and strain, bottle and label. This will last for months kept in the cool and dark. Now, most medicaments extract poorly into oil, but some work remarkably well. Things like St. John's wort, mullein flowers, and calendula infuse into oil really, really well. Most uses start with some kind of an infusion and then add oils or greases of some sort to make a salve or a cream. You can also start with an infused oil, my favorite way of doing it. You can use teas, tinctures, or infused oils, but I prefer to avoid using teas as it can lead to mold growth. This is my personal preference. If you're going to do them in small quantities and use them up in a short period of time, they're fine. But if you want anything that's going to store for a while, I would avoid using anything containing water. To your the infused oil or tincture, you can add nourishing butters like shea, cocoa, cocoa, mango, kapasu, whatever. You add beeswax or emulsifying wax as desired to make it as thick as you want. A starting point is one ounce of beeswax per cup of base. If that's too hard, add more oil or less beeswax the next time. You can add more oil to that preparation and thin it out but the next time you can just add less beeswax. Uh, if it's too soft for your taste, you can add more beeswax. Heat it in a double boiler just until melted enough to allow it to be mixed. You don't really want to heat this very much. You can add essential oils at this point if desired and mix well but gently. Bottle and label. These will be good for years, especially if you add the essential oils of thyme, oregano, or rosemary because they're strongly antibiotic. A poultice is a sol use for solid herbs. You chop, crush the herb, moisten it, place it on the skin, and hold it in place with a cloth. What could be simpler than that? And the science. Don't let your eyes glaze over here. Inflammatory products like COX-2, IL-1-beta, 
INOS or TNF-alpha cause inflammation in tissues. Anti-inflammatory medicaments reduce these inflammatory products. The greater the reduction, the stronger the medicament. Now, Dr. Brasher was in the garden talking with some other friends of his who are all were scientists, and they started talking about the medicinal uses of the plants. And the idea was, what is it about these plants that keeps them being used for the same things over generations? And it's got to be more than just word of mouth. So that generated a study among ULL, Pennington Biolabs, the USGS, and Rutgers University. Those were all the people who were there in the garden that day. They're studying 27 of the plants in the garden. What is in them that would account for their claimed use? They've already published the first study, which was on anti-inflammatories. It was in the journal Nutrition, and it's called Screening Native Botanicals for Bioactivity, a Multidisciplinary Approach. And the aim of that study was to identify native Louisiana plants from folk medicine as a potential source of therapeutic medicines. The plants and their uses. Mamu, Erythrinia herbacea. You use the roots, the seeds, or the leaves to make a tea or a syrup, and it's good for colds and pneumonia. Now, the science says that mamu can reduce TNF-alpha by over 50%. That's a good anti-inflammatory. Manglier, or groundsel bush, Baccarus halimifolia. Leaves, stem, or root make a strong tea because this stuff tastes bad. Good for respiratory products and flu. And the science says that it reduces IL-1 beta by more than 90%. Mauve or bristle mallow. Modolia caroliniana. This is a weed everybody sees in their garden. Runs along the ground, roots at every node, is pretty much everywhere. But the roots are good to make a syrup that is used for colds and whooping cough. And you can also pulverize the leaves and stems, mix with corn flour and grease, and use it to apply, what is it? It's a salve, okay. Apply to boils, pimples, and styes. Tea grass. This is one of my favorites. Herba serpent. Cedar rhombifolia. Use the leaves or stems to make a tea tincture or a poultice, and it's used for fever, infection, snake, and insect bites. Now, when I was touring people in the garden, I used to say, I know it works for insect bites. You can take a leaf, crush it in your fingers, and rub it on an itching bite, and the itch stops instantaneously. But if I get bit by a snake, I'm going for antivenin. Then I learned more about it. It contains products that are hemoprotective against malaria, babesia, and hemotoxic snake venom. That's most of our snakes here except for the coral snake. The compounds in this plant neutralize the hemotoxic venom and protect the red blood cells. It is in a unique category. It's hematotonic, it's hematoprotective, and it's hematoregenerative. So it helps the red blood cells regenerate, it protects them from the toxin, and it's a general tonic that makes them happier. I just find totally amazing. But let's go back here. The pounded leaves can be used for swelling, boils, or bites. The fruits for headaches. The mucilage is a great emollient for a sore throat. The roots treat rheumatism. The science shows that it, this plant can control infections, even things like MRSA and Clostridium difficile, the ones that all of our antibiotics are pretty impotent against because of the resistance. It definitely has been shown to cross into the bloodstream. So you take it into, in orally, and the medicine gets into the bloodstream. It contains potent constituents like cryptolepin, it's active against malarial parasites, staphylococcus bacteria, and tuberculosis. It's also active against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and this is very unusual. We don't have a single antibiotic that I know of that is active against both. It's one or the other. Now, for gram-negative bacteria, either require a synergist like piperine, which is black pepper extract, or a higher, longer dosing period. So, we also talked about it being hematoprotective. So it's a really great plant to have around for a weed. <laughs> uh, elderberry, suro, Sambucus canadensis. All parts of this plant are useful as an antioxidant. It lowers cholesterol. It boosts the immune system. It improves heart health. Most often it's used as a syrup. The science shows that it prevents cough, colds, and flu. It actually has been shown to prevent the flu virus from attaching to the cell. And if it can't attach, it can infect, because that's how it infects. Lizard's tail, herba malo. Sarurus cernuus, 
I like saying that. It's weird. It's used to treat wounds either internally as a tea or tincture or externally as a poultice. That was its historic use. The study found that it contains a potent inflammatory. The leaves, flowers, and roots inhibit IL-1 beta by over 90%. The leaves and roots inhibit COX-2 by over 50%. The flowers and roots inhibit INOS by over 50 and over 30%, respectively. Bitter melon, Mexicane, or more Mordica charantia. Locally, it was, they used to soak the fruit in whiskey. What's that? It's a tincture. They would use it for cramps and as a poultice applied to cuts and burns. Elsewhere in the world, it was used to reduce blood sugar in diabetics, but we have no documentation that it was used for that purpose in Acadiana. The science shows that it works as both a hypoglycemic and as an anti-inflammatory. Yarrow, the battlefield weed. Achillea millifolium. The leaves are the effective part of this plant. Use it to make a tea or a poultice. This plant is antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and anti-hemorrhagic. It stops bleeding. So for wounds, what could be better? You have something that stops bleeding, reduces pain and inflammation, and stops infections. That's a trifecta. Honeysuckle, chevrofoia, lanacera semperverens. And that's the coral, trumpet, or scarlet honeysuckles. Use the leaves or the whole plant. Can use that as a wash against sores and rashes. The science shows that the flowers lower cholesterol or antibacterial, antiviral, and tuberculostatic. Now that means that they stop the tuberculous organism from reproducing. It does, but not that it kills it. Antibacterial, antiviral means it kills bacteria, it kills viruses if viruses can be said to be killed. In traditional Chinese medicine, the flowers are used to reduce blood pressure, inflammation, fever, acute respiratory infection, common colds, inflammations of the skin and GI tract, and to reduce the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. That's a potent little plant. Mullen, mullen, verbascum thapsus. Use the leaves or the flower buds to make an infusion, especially in milk or oil. It's used as an emollient and astringent. It's very mucilaginous, meaning it's, it's ooey-gooey sticky, and that means it can coat surfaces and soothe them. So you have a sore throat, you take this, it will coat the throat and make it feel better. It reduces cough. It's good for respiratory and other inflammatory products, and it's antimicrobial. You can also use the leaves as a poultice for hemorrhoids. The flowers are used in an infused oil or tincture, and they're used to treat earaches. The infused oil has been shown to be just as effective as a prescription anesthetic eardrop. It contains the medicaments, flavonoids, saponins, tannins, terpenes, glycosides, and it's got 3% mucilage, which is really high. Rose of Sharon, Althea. You see it everywhere. Hibiscus syriacus. You use the roots to make a decoction or the leaves to make a glycerite. Used for inflammatory GI conditions like ulcers, reflux disease, and IBS. It reduces cough. It increases expectoration in asthma and chronic bronchitis. Also, the leaves can be used as a poultice, which helps stop bleeding. Lemon balm, citronelle. Now, citronelle and citronella are two different things. Citronelle is the French word for lemon balm. Melissa officinalis is the scientific name for the plant. Use the leaves to make a tea, which is useful for digestion, relaxation, sleep, fever, headache, and calming. You can mix it with other similar herbs like basil, spearmint, peppermint that can give you a taste that you like. The only notice is that continuous use of lemon balm may impact the thyroid, so I wouldn't use it on an, on an everyday basis. Spearmint, mint vert, mentha spicata. Use the leaves to make a tea for fever, headache, digestion. Reduces the symptoms of nausea, indigestion, gas, and sore throat. In medical news today in 2018 has shown that spearmint has vitamins, antioxidants, and vital nutrients like limonene, dihydrocarbone, menthol, and cineol. They can reduce arthritis, pain, stiffness, and disability. Also may lower blood pressure. Carvone is 100 times more potent at reducing blood vessel contractions than verapamil, a common blood pressure medication. 
It promotes relaxation, reduces stress, decreases anxiety, and improves sleep. So a spearmint tea isn't a bad idea before bed. Antibacterial actions have been shown against bacteria that cause foodborne disease, and it's also antifungal. Not bad for a little plant that grows everywhere. Basil. Leaves make a tea. Digestion, relaxation, sleep. Mix it with the other herbs if you don't like the straight basil taste. Red bay, petite laurier. Persia barbonia. The leaves are used to make a tea that's good for sinus problems and the bark to make a decoction that's good against colds. Now, the science shows that the new leaves inhibit IL-1 beta by over 90% and INOS by over 30%, and old leaves inhibit IL-1 beta by over 50% and INOS and COX-2 by over 30%. Doc. Patience or Laziel. It's Rumex species. There are a number of different species that are effective. Use the stem, the leaves, or the root to make a tea that's good for fever, brings it down, or liver problems. Buttonbush. Bois de Marais. Cephalanthus occidentalis. That's one of my favorite little plants. I love the flowers. They look like little aliens. Use the leaves to make a tea, the roots to make a decoction. Either is good for fever or digestion. So if you had the choice, leaves or roots, you go for the leaves. Not only are they a lot easier to get a hold of, but uh, it doesn't bother the plant near as much. Swamp dogwood, bois de flesh, cornus fomina. This is not your horticultural flowering dogwood, which is cornus florida. This is our native. And if, as you can see, the flowers are dramatically different from the large flowers of the cornus florida. Use the root or the bark. Before the discovery of quinine, Jesuit bark, which is the bark of this tree, was the only known treatment for malaria. They make a decoction with the bark and, or root, which is good for fever, malaria, and pain. You can use the leaves as a poultice for wounds as well. The cardinal flower, Lobeli cardinale, Lobelius cardinalis. The roots are used as a poultice for headache, the leaves as a tea for arthritis and to expel worms. It is toxic in large quantities because it contains the alkaloids, lobelamine, lobeline, and others, so I wouldn't advocate the use of this plant with any regularity. Rosemary, Rumerin, Rosemarinus officinalis. The leaves are used to make a tea that's good for digestion, headache, and cough. Historically, it was used for muscle pain, to improve memory, to boost the immune system, to improve the circulatory system, to promote hair growth, but in high doses it may be toxic, so it wouldn't take a whole lot of it for a long time. The French mulberry, chasse pareille, Calicarpa americana. The roots were used as a decoction, which was then used as a mouthwash to treat bad gums. It's also diuretic and was used to treat dysentery and stomach aches. The leaves are also used as a tea that produces an insect repellent. Or you can just crush the leaf and rub it on and use it as an insect repellent that way. Depends on whether you want to prep it ahead of time or not. In conclusion, knowledge begets knowledge. The thesis preserved knowledge, the healer's garden spreads knowledge and serves as a focal point. The collaboration and publication expands knowledge. Over 25% of all medicinal compounds are directly obtained from or chemically derived from plants. There are medically useful plants still waiting to be discovered. This is a good first step. If you happen to have access to any of these plants and would be willing to share them with us, you can contact me, Marianne Armbruster, through Vermilionville. Thank you for being with us today, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.